I feel some trepidation preaching Revelation um, because I know that lots of people have all these ideas as we come to it. And so I, last week I talked about imposter syndrome, how sometimes when I was early on in teaching, I'd dress up as, as a teacher and try and look like a teacher because I didn't feel like I really was a teacher. And I, I feel a little bit of imposter syndrome today, especially if, I, if it comes across that I know everything about the book of Revelation. I assure you I do not. It is a tough book. Yeah, I guess some of the reasons why Revelation can be a little bit scary for a preacher to get up and preach on is that there's all these... Well, if I ask you, what do you think of when, when I say we're going to look at Revelation? What are the pictures that come into your mind right now of things that are in the book of Revelation? I suspect for some of you, you're picturing some pretty scary images like beasts and dragons and marks on people's foreheads and numbers and, and trying to make sense of all these different things. And then there's this temptation then to nail down what the things in Revelation say, where we see them at work today. And so we try and nail down these prophecies and it's happened throughout the ages. The church has always got it wrong trying to go, oh, people have always got it wrong. I think it means this. I, oh, no, this is happening now. Oh, that's talking about this. And there's this danger to get all confused about, oh, what's going on and when is he talking about? And we try and nail down a timetable and every Every generation seems to somehow make it fit their generation and claim, oh, no, no, this, no, it wasn't then, it was, he's talking about this now. And so there's a fear of handling that, that I, I do that and get it wrong as well, and I don't want to do that. I want to be careful in what it does say. And I also think as one of the fears is that when I meet someone who loves talking about the book of Revelation and is obsessed with it, often when that happens, often, not always, but often, they're holding so tightly to ideas in Revelation that they start to forget lots of all the other bits of the Bible. And so Revelation can become this obsession of working out what is going on here. And we get so bogged down in that that we suddenly have lost sight of Jesus and, and the Gospels and everything else throughout the Old and New Testament. And we just, sometimes people are guilty of just, it becomes a hobby horse. They zoom in so much on Revelation that it becomes a distraction to all that God has revealed in his word. And I don't want that to happen for us as well. We need to treat God's word in its entirety and treat revelation as part of that, not separate to it, but part of his, his revelation of himself. Um, so in this series, we're just dipping our toes in, just dipping our toes into the water. We're just looking at the first couple of chapters and these seven letters to the seven churches. But my hope is that by doing so, by just dipping our toes in a little bit into revelation, that it gives you a bit more confidence to swim a bit deeper, to go out into the rest of the book, not with a fear, but with a real confidence that, okay, there's lots of scary picture language, but the thing that's being revealed is going to be not something that I need to fear, but that's going to be a help for me. So, so as we dip our toes in, uh, let, let's hope too that this gives us a confidence to swim out into the deeper waters of this book and, and to let God use it for the purpose that he intended it. Um, so here's some things to get us a little bit of a handle on Revelation, some helpful things to grab onto. The first thing we need to ask is, who is writing it and who's he writing to? And we're told that, we don't need to guess, in the start of it, we're told that this is uh, a message that was received by John, now, the same John who wrote John's Gospel, the, the, the disciple who Jesus loved, and he is writing it from a prison island. He is being persecuted because of his love of Jesus, and he's been put on prison, and that was not uncommon. It's during a time when Christians were getting persecuted. The church was going through lots of troubles and tribulations, and so John says that in verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John writes it to a bunch of Christians, to some churches, and particularly uh, to churches in the area. It's, it's referred to as Asia, but it's talking about Turkey, modern day Turkey. And there's these seven churches that receive it. And so that's the who and the when uh, is that it's during the, it's during that bit the century after Jesus had risen and gone into heaven. And so the church grew massively, but then it's, it's facing this huge persecution. And so John writes on the, on the eve of even more struggles and hardship facing the church, he writes to encourage them. Well, that's the who and the when. Another thing to ask is the what. What is this book? You might have all these ideas coming into it, but let's stop and just say, well, what does the book itself 
say it is? What does John say about it? Well, verse 1 of Revelation 1 tells us, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. The first thing we're told is this is a revelation. It's an apocalyptic type of literature. It's a particular type of writing called apocalyptic literature. And all that means is that it reveals truth about God using vivid picture language. And so as we read it, we need to keep in mind lots of the things that are being described are picture language to tell us a truth. They're not a, they're not a photograph of what's going on or what's going to happen, but they're broad brush strokes. They're a, they're a highly colourful and vibrant image and each of those parts of it, it's not some secret code we need to know, but rather we need to understand what's going on as Jesus through John paints this broad picture of who he is and what's going to happen. It's a particular type of literature and so we need to be aware as as we read it to treat it like that. Don't treat it like other bits of the Bible that are letters alone or that are um, stories and narratives. In Revelation, we have this revealing of truth through vivid picture language. And so sometimes that means we need to do a little bit of pausing as we read it. And rather than thinking, I think I know what's going on here and that's talking about this, we pause and we slow down and we say, what is this picture telling me in its broad categories? What is going on in this picture? And the second thing we're told here is that it's a prophecy. Verse 3, it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Now, prophecy means it's talking about something that is to happen. It's God's word revealing truth that hasn't yet taken place. And so some of the things that go on in the book of Revelation, it's a fulfillment of prophecy of the past. So we need to understand the Old Testament. And I can say this to you, the more you understand all of the the rest of the Bible, the clearer the picture language in Revelation becomes because all of it borrows from and grabs hold of all these Old Testament pictures and prophecies and all these New Testament pictures and prophecies and, and builds on those. And so this is something that speaks about some of the things that were um, taking place in John's time. So some of the prophecies were fulfilled Some of the prophecies in Revelation were fulfilled during John's time. They've already happened. We look back on them now. Some of them are prophecies that continue on again and again and again throughout history. So some of them we can expect to be able to look around and say, yeah, I think this is giving me a bit of a picture for what's happened in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth century, and it's still happening today in our century. Some of the prophecies are those continuing on ones. And other prophecies in Revelation are things that are not yet that haven't happened yet and will happen. Now, I've said three different categories, things that have already happened, things that are happening, and things that are in the future. And the tricky part is trying to work out which bit is which. And so we need to be careful in our reading of it that we don't quickly say, this is talking about this, when actually it was talking about something that happened back in John's day during the early persecution of the church and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Some of it is talking about that. So be careful in how we read it. And similarly, we don't want to say, uh, this is something that's now when really it's it's in the future and it's talking about a big picture of Jesus returning. So it's, pro- it's apocalyptic picture language. It's prophecy, God's fulfillment of things that he says will take place or have already taken place. And the third thing about this book is it is a letter. Now, that's the bit we're going to focus on in our series. These letters, seven letters from Jesus to his church. And the fact that it's a letter means that it had an original audience. We've said it was these seven churches in Turkey and probably it was a circular letter. They would read it and it would be passed on. And so it had to mean something to them then. It wasn't this vague, I have no idea what's going on, it's too confusing. As John wrote it, because it's a letter, we need to assume it needed to be clear and understandable to the original people who received it. And so sometimes the work we need to do is to think, almost put ourselves back in their shoes a little bit and say, what would they have understood this to mean? Rather than going, oh, yeah, well, I know what this means because I've Googled this and this is clearly about the euro or this is about this or that. The original readers had no idea about those things. And so be very careful in just 
applying it all to current day events. Instead, we need to ask, because it's a letter, we need to ask, what did the original hearers understand? Um, but it's not, let's not just treat it like a letter. Uh, it's a letter, yes, to those original churches, but because of those other two things, it being apocalyptic and prophecy, it is a timeless letter for us. And so even sometimes the, the way it uses numbers in there, there's a bit of symbolism going on. And so we're looking at seven churches. They are seven particular churches. Andrew read them out for us. Seven churches that existed in modern-day Turkey, uh, then called Asia. Uh, there's seven real churches. But the number seven, when you hear the number seven, what do you think of? God? Why? Seven is the perfect number. Perfect number. Why is seven the perfect number? Seven days of yeah, seven days. So there's this idea of completeness. The number seven often is used to, to talk about God and also to talk about completeness, all. And so even as it's to seven churches, it's a little bit of a hint that's going on here saying it's to all the churches. All the churches are being pictured, not just these particular seven churches. And so we need to listen to these words. I hope that's a little bit of a handy help as we, we start into the book of Revelation. Now, the big question then is this. If, if the who and when and the what has been answered, the next comes the why. Why is this book here? What does it exist for? Um, and I want to say one word summary of this book. <laughs> this is a dangerous thing, summarising a whole big book with one word. Um, but I think this is a, a fair way to summarise this book. And it is this word, conquer or overcome or victory. Uh, same Greek word. Do you know what the Greek word is? It's where you get um, the most famous brand of sports shoes, which is, you can say Adidas. No, it's not Adidas. Nike. Nike. Yes, so Nike or Nike, which is the Greek for victory, overcome or or um, conquer is the ASV words it. And so this book, this book is saying to the early church who feel like they're about to be conquered, right? They feel like they're going to be conquered. This book says, no, you will overcome. You need to be the ones who are the overcomers because you belong to the great conqueror, Jesus himself. And so this book, the whole book of Revelation is saying to Christians, don't give up. Don't give in. To those who feel like they're going to be conquered or are being conquered, this book says, Jesus says, be conquerors. We see it as we, as we spend some time in the, the seven letters to the seven churches. There's this phrase that comes up at the end of each of them that says, to those who have overcome or to those who conquer. To those who conquer. And it's saying to, to us, don't give up. If we, with all this scary imagery of what's going to happen, with all the realities of the world we live in, don't give up, don't give in. This book is about conquering because we belong to the great conqueror. And so Revelation does this in two ways. It prepares us for what lies ahead. It tells us, be battle ready. That's how you're going to be conquerors, okay? This book is teaching us to be ones who overcome. And it does that by not saying, do you know what? It's all okay. Everything's going to be easy. No, this book gives us a real, realistic picture that we face a battle. And so we need to be battle ready. If I brought you in and I just said nice words, there, there, everyone, everything's going to be okay, I'd be doing you a disservice, and so would God. And he doesn't do that. Instead, he says there is a battle. Things will be hard. It's going to get harder to follow me, but be ready. So that's the first thing this book does. It gives us a picture of what lies ahead so that we are ready for the battle. But that's not the main thing it does. The main thing it does in helping us be conquerors is it points us to the conqueror. It points us to Jesus. And it says, this strong one, this mighty one, this one who cannot be conquered, will never be conquered. He is with you and he is at work. So fear not. So it gets us ready for the battle, but it reminds us we have the mighty warrior Jesus fighting the battle for us. So that's the two things that are going on here. So let's spend a few minutes dwelling particularly on that second one, that we would fix our eyes on Jesus, that we would dwell on him this morning. I think that's worth our time. So will you spend a few minutes with me as we do that, looking at these verses? And the first thing we need to see is, who is he? Who is this Jesus? And so we're going to look at verse 12 through to 17. Again, Andrew already read it for us, but let me read it. Joe, could you put up on the screen for us verse 12 through to 17? We'll start at verse 12. Who is this Jesus? Who is he? Who is this Jesus that we gather here to worship? Let's hear. 
Verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. John says this, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Is that how you would describe Jesus if someone asked you to describe this one you know, this one you're learning about, this one you worship? Would you use these kind of lang- this kind of language? It starts off with the, the phrase, the son of man, and maybe you, you hear that and you think, oh, yeah, well, that's talking about, well, Jesus is fully God, but we also know he's fully human, and so maybe that's what's being emphasised here. When we hear son of man, we think of Jesus' humanity. Now, it is true, Jesus is fully human. He became one of us in every sense, fully human. But when the Bible talks about the Son of Man, and when Jesus uses that phrase of himself, which he used all the time in the Gospels, he used, he calls himself the Son of Man. When he does that and when the Bible does that, it feels like we should be thinking about his humanity. But strangely, that's not what we're meant to be thinking about. That title, Son of Man, is actually pointing us not to Jesus' humanity, but to a picture in Daniel chapter 7. Do you remember I said to understand the picture language here, we often need to think of Old Testament picture language? And that's exactly what's happening here. When John sees him and says there was one like a son of man, he's taking us to Daniel chapter 7, which uses that phrase to not emphasise Jesus' humanity, but to emphasise his divinity. Listen to what it says in in Daniel chapter 7. This prophecy pointing forward to this very time. It said this, Behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. That's the picture language in Daniel 7 that we're being presented with here. Don't think son of man and think, oh yeah, just another guy. No, here is the glorious king whose kingdom will be above all kingdoms and will last forever. And so the language being used is to say, this one is none other than the mighty God who sits on the throne. He is the son of God, but he is equal to God in every way. Recognize his power and his glory. That's what this picture gives us. And actually, as we go through that, that, those, couple of, those few verses I just read from verse uh, 12 onwards, the, all the pictures being described here, they're quite confusing. You think, hang on, I thought I knew what Jesus looked like. He's, he's that um, Hollywood bearded guy that we, we often have printed for us in photos. And no, here he's got white hair and he's got a sword coming out of his mouth and, and his voice is like a roaring river and there's these burning eyes and, and these bronzed uh, these sandals and the feet like this and, and all the, this picture language here. The, the face is shining and it's a glorious picture. This is not a picture of Jesus' physical appearance. This is not a picture of what he looks like. This is a picture of what he is like. See the difference? Each of these sections are telling us something about who he is, not just what he looks like. So he won't look like this. This isn't his looks being described. Instead, it's the glorious picture of his power and his might. And so again, all this layered upon language is telling us this one thing in particular. This Jesus is mighty God. This Jesus is mighty God. And so all the language, again, comes from the Old Testament. And so the robe and the sash, it's from Exodus 28. All pictures from the Old Testament of God himself and his Messiah, every one of these. Uh, The white hair, again, it's from Daniel 7, just like the Son of Man, white hair, Daniel 7. Uh, The eyes that are like burning fire, the feet like bronze from a furnace, the face like a shining sun, that's all from Daniel chapter 10. 
The voice like the roar of many waters is from Ezekiel 43, and it's describing in Ezekiel 43 where God's glory comes back into the temple. And so here we're seeing, here's the one whose voice is the glory of God. It's roaring and powerful. And the mouth like a sharp sword. Well, that's from Isaiah 49, and it's a picture of God's word cutting down and destroying all those enemies of God. All glorious pictures from the Old Testament of God and his Messiah. And they're all applied to Jesus. Is that the Jesus you worship and know? The picture we're being given here is of a Jesus who shouldn't be messed with. Note John's response. Does he go up and slap him on the back and go, Hey, Jesus, my homeboy. Does he even go up and hug him? And Oh, Jesus, good to see you, mate. That's how Aussies would do it, and Aussies would be completely wrong. Because what does John do? He, he collapses on the ground before him. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He recognises who this Jesus is and he doesn't go up and slap him on the back and be overly familiar with him. Instead, he bows down in fear and adoration and worship. How dare I be in the presence of such a one? Now, preachers always quote from C.S. Lewis. Do you know, are you familiar with C.S. Lewis, the, uh, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe? Uh, and particularly, I think um, they use the, the illustration that I'm now going to use. I tried. I tried to come up with something original. I thought, no, I don't want to just say the same one all other preachers use when they describe this. But um, you know what? I couldn't come up with a better one. <laughs> so rather than make you put up with my original one that's not so good, let me just use C.S. Lewis's great picture. In the, in the book, um, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, it's this allegory. It's a story that C.S. Lewis wrote to help us understand the biblical story. And so in the story, we have this character, Aslan, who is a lion. And Aslan in this story is meant to, meant to represent Christ working amongst his people. And so C.S. Lewis chose not some little guinea pig or a um, cute little, I, mean, I think Josh would choose a Tassie devil or something to be the one. that. No, he chose a lion. A lion. A roaring lion who walks among his people. And in the story... Uh, well, when, um, I'll read it from it. When Susan hears that Aslan is a lion, she's rather confused. And so she says this. Uh, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I think C.S. Lewis nails it here. And we often want Jesus to be safe. And by safe, we mean tame, that we can give him a little pat, that he can be moved around and manipulated, that he'll do what we want him to do, that he'll sit, sit there, Jesus, and do as I tell you to do, please. No. He's the roaring lion of Judah. It's not safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And so can I encourage you, dwell on who Jesus really is. There's a danger that we become overly familiar with him, and it's a danger I face probably more than anyone. I, I'm bringing God's word to you. We're doing church life together, and there's this temptation that it becomes oh so ordinary and small and unimpressive, and I forget that he's the line of Judah. And so I need to fear him properly and respond to who he really is. Uh, one preacher who, who I listened to on this particular passage, he said it this way about these verses. You could describe the Christian life as learning to let go of the wrong fear and embrace the right fear. No longer fearing the world because of who we have as our king. And learning to fear in the right way, not to run away from him, but the right way to say, this is, this is the line of Judah. This is the one being described here in these glorious terms, who is the king who sits on the throne and I need to respond appropriately to him. Maybe this morning you need to repent of being just a little too familiar with Jesus, treating him as a tame little pet when really he is the roaring lion. See, we overcome not by summoning strength from within, but by looking to Christ and seeing him as he really is and fearing him instead of the world. 
So that's what we see of who, who he is. What about what he has done? See, the lion, this lion, is the one who made himself a lamb. Can you believe it? The lion of Judah says of himself that he's also the lamb. But don't get confused, when Jesus describes himself as a lamb, he's not meaning the kind of lamb you go and pat at the petting zoo. He's not saying the mighty lion became one that you can sit on your lap and cuddle up to. No, it's not a lamb in a petting zoo. It's a lamb on an altar, a lamb who was slain. Uh, verse 5, which we, we didn't read, but, but it says this, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. This mighty lion freed us because he loves us, and he did so by offering himself as a sacrifice. He died in our place. His blood was spilled so that we could be forgiven. That's what we're told here. He freed us from our sins by his blood. That is what he has done. Verse 18, which we did read, which Andrew read for us, says this, He's the living one. And he says, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. He died and came back to life. He's the living one. But he died, don't forget that. And he did so to win victory over our greatest enemy. And so we need not fear, not just because of who he is, but because of what he has done for you. He became a lamb and died that you would be forgiven. He purchased you. He freed you from sin by his blood. That is what he has done. And the final thing I want to finish on, who he is, what he's done, gives us great certainty and assurance. But the final thing is, what is he doing? What is he doing? Uh, when John collapses in fear, Jesus says, fear not. He says, I am the first and the last, the living one. He's the living one. He's the one who gives us life. That is what he is doing. Satan wants to make out like Jesus wants to take your life away, your freedom away. You know, oh, there's such a great life, but you don't get to do any of that because you're a Christian. Poor you. That's what Satan's lie is, that Jesus wants to take life from you and give you something less instead. But that is a lie. Jesus is the living one. He's the one who gives life and life to the full. Everything else is a counterfeit and is rubbish. Satan makes out, the world makes out, like that is where true life is found. But here we're told, no, Jesus is the living one. He gives us life. He holds the keys to death and life. He is the one who sits on the throne. He is the living one who gives life. And verse 20 tells us this picture. It's this picture that's been built up, that he is holding the seven stars and these seven lampstands. And maybe as you read that, you're a little bit confused. What's this talking about? These seven stars and seven lampstands. But Jesus tells us what it is. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. What is he doing? Well... Jesus is holding the church in his hand. He is holding the church in his hand because it is his church. Now, we look around sometimes and we despair at what's going on in the church. I look around and I think, oh, man, how could they be so wishy-washy on the gospel? And, and, how, and I'm sure people do the same as they look at me and criticise and look at our church and criticise. It's easy to criticise and think, oh, everything's gone wrong and be discouraged. But here we're reminded... Jesus holds the church in his hand. It is his. This church was never Brendan's church. It's not my church. It will never be John's church. This is Jesus' church. He holds it in his hand. He's the one who is at work. And more than that, and this is surprising because as we're going to look at these seven churches, we're going to see some churches that get things really badly wrong. I mean, they get some things right. <laughs> they get some things gloriously right. That is good. But boy, do they get some things wrong. And it would be tempting to think uh, Jesus is nowhere near them and has nothing to do with it. But here we're told, what is he doing? He is at work tending to those lampstands. He's at work amongst them. He's surrounded by his church. And the picture is of Jesus going round. And as that little flame starts to flicker, he tends to it and makes sure there's more oil. He trims the, the wick. He makes sure that it doesn't go out because he loves his church. 
and he identifies with it because he's amongst us. He's not up, up there waiting. Look, look, I'm going up to heaven. You guys sort yourself out down there. I'll be waiting for you. I'll be up there waiting for you. No, he's amongst us. And so as we spend time looking at these seven churches, as I said, they're spectacular failures and, and some of the things they get right. It is great starting point to remember that these churches, and indeed we, belong to Jesus and he is at work amongst us. The conqueror, the mighty one who was dead and is now alive, he is with us. And so the application of this is, well, if you don't know Jesus or if you've treated him as a little pet, stop it. He's not one to be trifled with. He's not one to be ignored. You can't just treat him as a little cute little religious figure who makes me feel nice. He's the mighty king. Recognize who he is. You need to come before him and bow before him and worship him and ask him for forgiveness. And he will say yes, but don't trifle with him. Don't ignore him. And to us, his church, he says this. Don't give up. Don't give in. He is with us. Now, if, I, if we were sitting on the beach, right, and a big tsunami started coming towards a massive big tidal wave, and I said to you, don't worry, it's going to be all right, and I patted you on the back, would that comfort you? Maybe a little bit, depending on the time. No, Debbie's just giving a flat out no, not at all. Why would that not comfort you? No, I can't do anything. I can't save you. I can't stop the wave, can I? It's, it's no good. It doesn't mean much. It's, it might be well intended. And sometimes I think we think of Jesus like that. Him saying, don't worry, it's okay. I'm with you. And we think, yeah, so what? Look at the wave coming my way. But this is not the kind of comfort that Jesus gives. He is the one who can say, be still. And the wave stops. And so when the conqueror says to you, do not fear. That's different to me saying it to you. If I say to you, do not fear, you'd be right to say, nice, nice words, Dave, but that don't do much. <laughs> but Jesus, the conqueror, who will not be destroyed, who cannot be overcome, who is not taken by surprise by anything this world throws at him, he says to us, I am with you. I am amongst you. Don't panic as this world seems to have lost its way. Don't fear he will not be overcome, and so neither will we. Amen.